So today, this Saturday, is a feast of the presentation of Our Lady, Blessed Virgin Mary, in the temple, November 21st. Epistle from the Book of Wisdom. From the beginning and before the wor world was I created, and unto the world to come I shall not cease to be. And in the holy dwelling place I ministered before him. And so was I established in, in Sion, and in the holy city likewise I rested. And my power was in Jerusalem. And I took root in an honorable people, and in the portion of my God, his inheritance. And my abode is in the full assembly of the saints. We stand for the gospel. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, as Jesus was speaking to the multitudes, a certain woman from the crowd, lifted, lifting up her voice, said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and the breasts that gave thee suck. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that who hear the word of God and keep it. Seated. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. 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 The Feast of the Presentation of Our Lady in the Temple should remind us of some important truths of our holy religion. During these years in the Temple, God was preparing Our Lady for her important vocation, Mother of God, Mediatrix of all graces, Co-Redemptrix. The Blessed Virgin Mary was to be the woman of Genesis, the woman of the Gospel, and the woman of the Apocalypse the cooperating agent in the plan of God from the incarnation of Jesus Christ to the redemption. Mary was the intermediary between Jesus and St. John the Baptist, sanctifying him before his birth. She was the one who asked Christ to make his first public miracle at the wedding feast of Cana before his public life had begun. And during the Passion, she followed him in every step of his sufferings, showing us that she was associated in the mission of reparation for the sins of mankind. After the resurrection, the Holy Ghost descended upon her first, and then upon the apostles, showing that she was the, to be, she was the matrix of all the graces of the newborn church. By her divine maternity, Mary became the co-redemptrix, taking on the role of matrix of all graces. In 1921, Pope Benedict XV instituted November 8th as the feast day of Our Lady of Feast Mediatrix of All Graces. A text by St. Louis Grignot de Montfort expresses his truth admir admirably when he said, Only Mary found grace before God, Luke 1.30, without the help of any other creature. And after her, all those who found grace before God, found it only through her. Mary was full of grace when the archangel St. Gabriel saluted her, Luke 128, and was filled with grace when the Holy Ghost so mysteriously overshadowed her, Luke 135. From day to day, from moment to moment, she increased so much that this twofold plenitude that she attained an immense and inconceivable degree of grace. So much so that the Almighty made of her the only custodian of his treasures and only dispenser of all his graces, so that she might ennoble, exalt, and enrich all she chooses. She can lead them along the narrow path to heaven and guide them through the narrow gate to life. She can give a royal, royal throne 
scepter and crown to whomever she wishes. Jesus is always and everywhere the fruit and the son of Mary. And Mary is everywhere the true tree that bears the fruit of life, the true mother who bears the son, that son. So that was a quotation from True Devotion. Consider the ensemble of graces she received and corresponded to perfectly. St. Louis Rignon de Montfort, with his heavenly wisdom, says that she can receive more grace than any other person did or ever will. She received more graces than the assemble of mankind, and therefore the graces others receive are part but a participation of the graces she received and an overflowing of them. We understand, therefore, what the universal mediatrix of graces is. It is the graces that fall entirely to the only mediatrix between Jesus and Christ and men, and from her they overflow to men. If this is so, and we know it's, it is, then why should we be so concerned about our enemies, the devil, the world, and the flesh? When we know that Our Lady is full of grace, and the mediatrix of all graces, even our sins become less distressing, because with just one word from her, we can be freed of everything bad. We can become clean and pure again. If we would be convinced of the immeasurable quantity and quality of graces that Our Lady has, we would have more confidence more joy, and more hope in our spiritual lives. Such persuasion should come from the super plenitude of graces that Our Lady has. She is the necessary door that leads to us to Jesus Christ. Now what is the will of Our Lady? Since she does not appear in mystical ways to communicate with us, how can we know her will? Above all other things, the will of Our Lady lies in the Catholic doctrine and the obedience to the Catholic Church as she always was. In essence, this is the will of Our Lady because her will coincides with the will of God. Obedience to the Catholic Church is therefore the clearest and most indisputable component of the will of Our Lady. But there's another factor which is the voice of grace in us. Grace indicates to each person a way to follow it in order to achieve God's plan for her, for him or her. This is what is commonly called the vocation of a person. The vocation is the call of God, the call of Our Lady to fulfill that pre-established plan they have for each one of us. Therefore, to correspond to one's vocation it is also to accomplish the will of Our Lady. How should one correspond to his or her vocation? It is to do everything that one can to preserve the deposit of Catholic doctrine, as it always was taught by Holy Mother Church. Now, now then, since Vatican II, this, this deposit of faith, morals, liturgy, and canon law has been systematically attacked by the enemies of the Church, who infiltrated her inside and replaced her with doctrine with quite different new teachings. Therefore, obedience to one's vocation implies a defense of this deposit from the enemies who attack it. Hence, to be faithful to the call of Our Lady, we must fight to destroy her enemies in our days. There is another point that still needs to be addressed. If to carry out, our, the, out the will of Our Lady is to follow the will of the Church, one could affirm that the Middle Ages was already the reign of Mary. So why do we expect a future reign of Mary? We have the following reasons. In the 17th century, Our Lady of Good Success appeared to a conceptionist sister in, in, in Quito, Ecuador, and asked her to make reparation for the great religious crisis in the 20th, 20th century, which would affect every sacrament. It is significant that as a symbol of this crisis, the tabernacle light in the church went out. She promised her intercession, quote, at the very moment 
when the evil will when the evil will appear triumphant and when the authority abuses my power this will mark the arrival of my hour when I in a marvelous way will dethrone the proud and accursed Satan trampling him under my feet and fettering him in the infernal abyss end of quote and in the 18th century, St. Louis de Montfort, the prophet of the reign of Mary, foresaw the age of men and women to come who will not be great because of their own merit, but because they are molded by Mary, quote, for the purpose of extending his empire over that of the impious, the idolaters, and the Muslims, end of quote. And it is in his passionate and moving, fiery plea for the Marian Apostles, St. Louis of Montfort cries out, quote, Fire, fire, fire! Help, help, help! Fire in the house of God, fire in souls, fire even within the sanctuary, end of quote. He speaks at length about, quote, a con congregation, an assembly, a choice, a selection of predestined souls by whose works the face of the earth may be renewed and the church reformed. End of quote. And in the 19th century, St. Catherine Labore predicted an era of peace in which Christ would reign as king on earth and in which Mary would play a special role. And at the beginning of the 20th century, Our Lady appeared at Fatima, Portugal, and told the three shepherd children that the heirs of communism would spread as a punishment for humanity and declare a universal chastisement if man did not convert. But after this succession of events would take place, she foretold her triumph and a time of peace. As one Catholic writer explains, Marian Hovart, the promises of Our Lady are irreversible and perfect. And since we have not just have not yet seen this triumph, we have every reason to hope for it. We need confide in this triumph, which must be most perfect and most complete. For as St. Louis de Montfort says in his first line of true devotion to Mary, it was through the most holy virgin Mary that Jesus Christ came into the world, and it was also through her that he has to reign in the world. And what will be the reign of Mary? The reign of Mary will be the assemble of people, nations, institutions, customs, laws, which will be completely conformed to, to an act according to the law of God. Our Lady will be queen only where our Lord is king. The reign of Mary will be the reestablishment of the kingship of Christ on earth in the spiritual and temporal spheres. It will be the triumph of Christ in Mary or the triumph of Mary in Christ, as St. Louis de Montfort says. It will be, in fact, the restoration of Christendom. Now, these ideas are beautiful, but only have meaning in the definition of a future era of light and glory, in which the great majority of men will live in a state of grace, fulfilling the law of God. Thus, the reign of Mary will have two essential elements. One is, inter is internal and personal, by which individual souls will love God, Our Lady, and the Church, and follow the laws of God. The other is a result of, th of this. Peoples and nations will be organized and live according to the law of God. That is, families, social groups, societies, and nations will be ordered and live according to the laws of God and the Church. It is this reign of Mary for which we should strive and live for. Here enters a, key, a very key, key problem. 
when we consider the present state of the world and of the church, as well as the present state of our own souls and our meager capacities, we realize that there's a large chasm to be crossed from here to the reign of Mary. We look at this ensemble, and it can be discouraging to face the extreme, extremity of evil all around us. It can even appear at times that the revolution has conquered everything. And then we look at ourselves, unfaithful and weak, irresolute and uncertain, mere shadows of what we should be and need to be for so great a task as a restoration of Christendom. It is obvious that our virtue is not proportionate to the problem we are facing. Thus it seems that we must be near a time when Our Lady will give a very great grace to mankind to make us what we should be, what we, we desire to be, by which still we are not. This is a solution that can resolve such a disproportion. We can only conjecture here how, how such a grace would be or come about. Perhaps it would be the great warning or the great illumination predicted by St. Edmund Campion and others that the grace of contrition will transform us, will draw us into ourselves to see ourselves objectively as truly as we are in God's eyes. For none of us have been what we should be. None of us at heart wants to see the profundity of the evil, the reality of the transgressions against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We need, therefore, the grace of contrition to transform us, just as the gaze of Christ transformed Peter in the courtyard of Caiaphas. This grace of contrition is necessary for us to be part of the reign of Mary. For in a world that takes our Lord Jesus Christ as a model of perfection, his cross must be present. Nothing will have value without this essential element. The norm of life for the modern man is that we should be, we should be happy without the cross. Everything around us, around us insinuates that we should avoid all suffering. No one should have to suffer. None of us deserves to suffer, according to modern man. This tendency to avoid all suffering is so deeply ingrained in our mentality that it can seem a part of our very person, like another nose or another arm or another leg. However, it seems that we can, we can hope that with the grace of contrition, the remnants of this attitude in our souls will dissipate. With the grace of contrition enters a willingness to carry the cross and an even a desire to make reparation for our sins. Such a grace would not only prepare us to accept the great chastisement, but to even embrace it. There are moments for all of us when the way to the reign of Mary may seem hopelessly distant or impossible. Then we need to remember that the way of providence is that God gives his, mo his great victories after the moment when everything seems lost. And he does it through small instruments, like David with a slingshot and Moses with his staff, to prove that it was he and only he that gave the victory. Moreover, there is the great tool God reserved to fashion this future era. It is the secret of Mary, who will form the great saints of the latter times. We have to consider that we are living at a period that is at the, the end of a historical era, in a situation in which the evil has reached such an extremity that is aiming to destroy the Holy Church from within and from the highest ranks in the clergy. In fact, the hierarchy of the counter church of Vatican II is full of Freemasons. Given the extremity of the evil we are witnessing, it seems proper that we confide that Our Lady will manifest the extremity of her goodness in a way as never before. 
Therefore, we have, we have to confide in her mercy and trust completely in it. We will make our resistance with courage and conviction with confidence. And it is certain that her goodness and mercy will open for us the doors of the reign of Mary and the restoration of Christian civilization in an unexpected and a marvelous way. Hence, let us persevere in our praying devoutly the Holy Rosary every day, especially all 15 decades if possible, and tr live a truly Christian life, consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.